Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Hellbound, Hellraiser 2, released in 1988. Though it was weird as all shit, the first Hellraiser was a success, so a sequel was planned pretty much immediately. Clive Barker was busy with Nightbreed, so he didn't return to direct, but he was a very hands-on executive producer, making sure Hellbound felt consistent with the first film. Barker also wrote the story for Hellbound, which picks up immediately after Hellraiser concludes. Kirsty Cotton, free of Pinhead, but telling an unbelievable tale, is stuck in a psychiatric ward with a power-hungry doctor looking over her. His yearning to know and experience all leads to Julia Cotton's return in a full-on trip to hell. And, of course, the return of the fan-favorite characters, the Order of the Gash, aka Pinhead and the Cenobites. Hellbound is honestly a kick-ass sequel, arguably just as good as the first movie. What I love is how different it is in tone and scale, but how it still feels like a quote, direct and honest sequel. The two movies could be watched together as one continuous epic story, which is probably owed to the continuity of cast and crew. Replacing Clive Barker as director was Tony Randell, the New World exec who gave them extra money for the first film to do Frank's awesome resurrection scene. He was also responsible for bringing on Christopher Young as composer. Randell was initially nervous on set since this was his first time directing, but he benefited from a supportive crew who had also returned from the original. And I mean the whole crew, from the makeup team and cinematographer to the editor and production designer. Taking up script duties was Peter Atkins, a delightful-seeming fellow who was longtime friends with Barker. Atkins and Randell hashed out the final script together and became lifelong friends, which was not what they expected at first. New world executive. Some cunt in a suit. What the hell? With Hellbound continuing the first film's patented combination of sex and gore, we're gonna need a sponsor to help keep this video clean from any YouTube issues. Thank goodness for Dr. Squatch! Dr. Squatch makes my favorite bars of soap ever, all made with natural ingredients and smelling oh so freaking good. I love not using a loofah and liquid soap anymore. I much prefer these mean lean bars of body cleaning. Right now, Dr. Squatch is doing a holiday bundle deal with all of their products, including their wonderful deodorants. Mmm. You can build your own bundles, which will not only get you tiered discounts, but can also make for great holiday gifts. They'll be here sooner than you realize. So instead of scrambling last minute and getting someone a risky puzzle box, just get them something they'll actually use. Fantastic smelling soap. Right now, new customers can get 20% off on orders of $20 or more. Just use my code DSCDEADMEAT and click the link in the description below. If someone dies when they're already in hell, will their kill go on the count? Let's find out, Hellraiser heads. The movie begins with the title card! Hold up, that's the old one though. Yeah, we getting a little recap, cause the first two Hellraisers are tight. But I ain't counting recap bodies, so on to the actual title card! There it is. We're in a wartime room in 1920s India, where British Captain Elliot Spencer works at a familiar puzzle box. He solves it, and the box does what it always does, transforming the room and itself. It spits out chains and hooks that cause Spencer to scream as they dissect his head and, wait a minute, driving nails? Haha, <laughs> that's right! This is Pinhead's orange! Motherfuckers. We're witnessing the birth of a Cenobite here. Captain Elliot Spencer is played by Pinhead's actor Doug Bradley out of makeup. Unfortunately for Elliot Spencer, his makeup artist is hell. Kirsty Cotton wakes up in a psychiatric hospital. A Michael Shannon looking cop writes out her bland boyfriend with a couple of lines. Don't worry about him, he's okay. We sent him home hours ago. And we never saw Steve again. It was Steve, right? The hospital Kirsty's at is run by Dr. Chenard, who sounds like a great candidate to meet Pinhead and Co. We have to see. We have to know. Yeah, the gash is gonna love this guy. Chenard and Kirsty learn that the cops have found a dirty mattress at her father's home, and she warns everyone that they've got to destroy that mattress. See, Julia died on it, and she can come back now like Frank. Is that so? The obvious villain asks. Though Chenard is merely impassive towards most of his subjects, he's extra cruel towards the most vulnerable, whom he keeps locked up in the basement. Get them off me! Kirsty's also seeing things, like a skinless person writing a bloody message on her wall. Gnarly hallucination. Except, turns out this blood is real. Does that mean- Oh, Kirsty, don't put that on your lips. Come on! Did you learn that from your stepmother? Kirsty thinks it's her father asking for help, so she confides in Chenard's assistant, Kyle. I'm Kyle McRae. 
Call me Kyle. Yeah, what the fuck else was I gonna call you? Mr. McCray? You look like you need to be saved by the bell. No wonder his troops didn't take him seriously when they were fighting aliens. Kirsty tells Kyle that her father is stuck in hell and that she needs to help him. Kyle offers to go get Dr. Chenard. He got a ticket to hell? He got a ticket to hell. Actually though, Chenard is looking to purchase a ticket to hell. Cause Kyle overhears him inquiring about the bloody mattress that they found. He's super interested in it after Kirsty gives a two minute recap of the first film, during which she mentions that Julia's body wound up on that mattress. I like that the recap incorporates unused footage from the first movie. It shows us Larry and Julia's wedding, where Frank stood there looking like a goober. <laughs> Chenard has the mattress delivered to his home office, then leaves to run an errand, giving Kyle a chance to sneak inside. Yo, dude, I think your boss might be into some weird shit. Like, he's got a picture of that guy? I know that guy. He's bad news, man. Kyle's perusal of schematics and configurations is interrupted by Chenard returning with someone else. It's Browning, the guy from the hospital who thinks he's covered in bugs. He's played by Oliver Smith, who was Frank the monster in the first film and that flesh monster in the hospital. The filmmakers wanted to give Smith a role where his face would be seen as thanks for all that hard skinless work. Self-harm warning, cause Chenard's going for world's evilest doctor here. He gives Browning a straight razor and shit gets real nasty real fast, as Browning sees this as a tool to rid himself of all these creepy skin crawlers. On set, Smith used a blunted razor with a blood tube attached, but he went so hard he he ended up leaving marks on his body, even though he was using the razor over a prosthetic piece on his chest. His self-mutilation soaks the mattress in blood, causing some spindly limbs to spawn and quickly wrap around his body. It's a female flesh monster, Julia friggin' Cotton, and she slides around with Browning for a good long while, just turning that office into a goddamn gory slip and slide. Careful there, Kyle! Don't get caught now! He peeks through the curtain and sees enough to make him leave, right before Julia kills Browning by draining away his life force. Mmm flesh and blood. Bugs or not, that dude was a good meal. Julia asks Chenard for help, and unlike Frank, doesn't demand he avert his eyes. Don't be scared of me. Yeah, sure, nothing scary about seeing muscles stretched across an exposed spine. <laughs> what are you, lady, part seven Jason Voorhees? The next morning, Julia's hanging around Chenard's ultra-modern house, leaving bloody handprints and punching out mirrors. Mirror had it coming. He gives her some threads that she promptly sullies with blood, so they try something with more coverage and wrap her up in bandages. <laughs> that should cut down on makeup costs. Hmm, looks like all them bandages got this step mummy feeling horny. <laughs> oh man, that's gross. And always with the fingers in these movies. Chenard Chenard helps Julia find more flesh by bringing her eight bodies to feast on. We only see the eighth victim being killed. The other seven are shown already dead, hanging around in this cool sweeping shot that goes around the room. With all of them people in her tum-tum now, Julia's healed enough to let her hair down. Damn, girl, you get a new stylist since the first film? You are glowing! Returning to play human Julia was English actor Claire Higgins, who I think makes for an awesome lady villain. In fact, Clyde Barker wanted Julia to be the franchise's main antagonist, but viewers were more into the Cenobites, and Higgins wanted more for her acting career. She'd go on to win multiple Olivier Awards and a Tony for her work on stage. Skinless Julia, just like with Skinless Frank, needed an actor thin enough to wear the muscle prosthetics. That actor was South African Deborah Joel, whose makeup process went smoothly since the crew had learned a lot from the first film. Little John Cormican took the lead and sculpted her face, basing his design on H.R. Geiger drawings of beautiful women as robots. Makeup artist Beverly Pond Jones helped sculpt the body, taking special care when it came to the buttocks. Nice. Kyle goes to the hospital and tells Kirsty that Chenard resurrected a monster. When he mentions the boxes he saw in Chenard's office, Kirsty demands they go there so she can try to save her father. He agrees to help. I can do that. I'm a doctor. Oh, that's right, you are. Hey, have you met my friend Larry Gordon? I'm a doctor. You two have a lot in common. You've also got a lot in common with everyone else in this goddamn movie. I know. While Chenard is out again, they sneak in through the office window. Kyle goes upstairs to look around and is found by Julia. Hush now, child. She pretty much instantly seduces him in spite of the bloody bodies hanging nearby. Come to mother. Careful there, buddy, cause baby don't got back. Literally, she's uh, she's missing her back skin there. She'll be fine after digging her fingers into Kyle and sucking his life force out. See, skin as clear as day. Hers, that is, not Kyle's. His uh, his skin is fucked. Kirsty pockets a picture of a pre-pinhead Spencer and leaves Chenard's office to go up to the attic. There, she finds Kyle's body and her old arch rival. I'm no longer just the wicked stepmother. 
Now I'm the evil queen. That awesome evil queen knocks Kirsty out with a single backhand. Gennard shows up with a girl named Tiffany, another patient at the hospital who's been shown a few times. She doesn't speak, has no family, and had to be named by the staff. The only thing she seems to care about is solving puzzles. You see where this is going. Gennard puts Tiffany in his escape room looking office and gives her the lament configuration to figure out. He and Julia watch from behind a two-way mirror. Or one-way mirror? I think it's two-way? Eh, whatever, fuck it. In no time at all, old Lemmy configures continues its non-stop streak of being solved by people. Seriously, how easy is that thing? At this point, it's just a free smoke and light show. Everyone and their stepmothers are solving it, no problem. Yeah, dude, everyone does. As always, the box makes a giant mess of things as it opens up doors into the hallways of hell, out of which emerge everyone's favorite leather daddies, and leather mommies, and leather, uh, you know, whatever really. Pinhead's crew is getting ready to gash poor Tiffany until the lead Cenobite comes out and says no. It is not hands that call us. It is desire. Wait, really? Because Kirsty didn't desire you when she opened the box in the hospital, but you still came after her anyway. Best get some consistent rules, brah, or you're asking for YouTube comments. The Cenobites listen to PH and walk away from Tiffany like, bye! The lament configuration promptly resets itself. Kirsty wakes up in the attic and comes downstairs so she can, oh, okay, just run into hell, why don't ya? Now everybody's in these mindfuck hallways amidst the giant matte painted labyrinth. I think it looks cool. Tiffany ends up in the circus-themed development hell that the killer clown sees has been in for the past 30 years. Also, I'm guessing this is what hell looks like for a lot of people. It's a trippy sequence with a lot of unique style decisions, including funhouse clown faces and a weird looking plastic baby. Ooh, maybe keeping secrets. While lost and spinning around, Kirsty's transported into her own personal hell, complete with bleeding pictures and portraits of Julia. This hell is a creation courtesy of Pinhead, who's here with his pals, happy to see Kirsty again. He welcomes her to their dimension and turns the lament configuration into a diamond kind of thing. Aw, oh, he's proud of himself for that one. Kirsty claims she shouldn't be here since she didn't open the box, and the Cenobites respond with their wonderful sarcastic indifference. Didn't open the box, and what was it last time? Didn't know what the box was. And yet we do keep finding each other, don't we? Female Cenobite is now played by Canadian actress Barbie Wilde. It's a different look since Wilde doesn't have Grace Kirby's sunken cheeks, and she wasn't given those little bits of hair she had in the first one. Makeup artist Marc Coulier adapted the design to the new actor, who sometimes needed extra touch-ups because she was so animated on set. Wilde really got along well with returning Cenobite actors Simon Bamford and Nicholas Vince. What's not to like about Barbie Wilde? Pinhead tells Kirsty that she can't save her father since he's in his own hell just as she is in hers. But please Please, feel free, explore. Explore it she does, until she runs into Tiffany, whom she begs to close the box so they can get the hell out of hell. Chenard gets a hell tour from Julia and sees blurry group sex in hot tubs with chains. I have such sights to show you. Yeah, that shit's only the beginning, Doc. There's also this giant mad painting and this giant spinning diamond. Julia says this diamond is her god now and that it's what sent her back to the land of the living. The god of flesh. Hunger and desire, my god, Leviathan. Lord of the Labyrinth. The Lord of Hell was originally a slimy tentacled monster in a pit of ooze and gore. This much more Lovecraftian great beast was created by Clive Barker, but Barker supported the change when director Tony Randell wanted something more abstract and ordered. Randell and writer Peter Atkins changed the god to the geometric perfection of Leviathan, and Simon Sace designed the diamond figure based on his design of the lament configuration. Composer Christopher Young provided subtle support through his score. He included Tibetan horns blowing out the Morse code for G-O-D. Meeting God leaves Chenard feeling a little woozy here and triggers a montage full of negative imagery and flashes of freakiness. Haha, <laughs> where are you gonna be when the Leviathan kicks in? Julia thanks Chenard for coming because Leviathan wanted her to bring its souls. She pushes him inside the Leviathan's creation chamber, essentially a little torture box that splits his face apart like it were a layer cake. It sticks all sorts of stuff in his body and in his face. I've always thought that last shot of him going down is kind of funny though. Later, the Lament Configuration changing room opens up up to reveal that Dr. Chenard has become a brand new Cenobite. And to think, I hesitate. A tentacle appendage of Leviathan appears and drills into Chenard Cenobite's head. It's taking control of him like a puppet for the greater good, and also for this funny vibrating yell. 
The Chenard Cenobite was designed by Jeff Portis, who also did Pinhead's design. Portis took over for Bob Keen as Hellbound's chief makeup artist, leading a team of many returning and new young artists at Image Animation. In Chenard's design, Portis included references to other films, like a bullet hole similar to Robocops and burnt skin evocative of Fred Krueger. Though he tried to make things convenient with a pullover mask, actor Kenneth Cranham still said the Cenobite outfit was uncomfortable, especially when he was harnessed to the Leviathan tentacle. The days I was the monster, I would often sort of fought him by myself with some cold Chardonnay, just to sort of take the curse off this sort of rather crushing costume. As for the tentacle itself, it's covered in KY jelly and has herpes looking sores on it because Portis designed it to look like a dick. I just said let's make it look like a big cock. It looks like a giant penis. A 15 foot long mechanical penis. A Penis. It was meant to look like a penis. What do you want? Kirsty leaves Tiffany to walk through the door of her father's house, hoping to find him. Instead, she finds a mausoleum of erotica with many slabs of writhing, moaning bodies. But don't get too excited, Kirst. These bodies play hard to get. Because this is the blue-balling personal hell for the man who's been writing for help this whole time. Old switchblade Frank Cotton. It's only Uncle Frank. Kirsty's dad is dead and staying dead for good. Now she's got a crisis thanks to this psycho. Human Frank is once again played by Sean Chapman, but this time they didn't overdub his voice. He got to say these lurid lines in his own American accent. Oh, Kirsty. So ripe in your confusion, so luscious in your pain. Frank's lured Kirsty here because he wants to have sex with her. The pro of that? She's not a ghost who will disappear when you lift the sheet. The con of it is, of course, that she is in fact his niece. Kirsty defies him and starts a fire, making this place look more like a traditional hell. It melts Frank down until he's a flesh monster again, which is when Julia walks in, holding Tiffany by the arm. Frank tries to lean on Julia's previous obsession with him, but he overplays his hand. You belong to me. This Julia ain't the same Frank fan club president. She's her own bad mama, and she'd rather just rip Frank's heart out. Nothing personal, babe. I don't know if this should count as a kill since Frank's already dead, but Julia looks too badass here for me to not include it. Kirsty and Tiff are trying to escape when a hallway erupts into some kind of dimensional tear. Julia shows up, and all three ladies start getting sucked up by the space. Kirsty and Tiff are able to hold onto the doorway, but Julia is bested by the powerful force, which rips the skin right off her back and sucks her away. Hell yeah! Wow, that was like a snake shedding its skin. Freaking dope. Kirsty and Tiffany repeat a beat from the original by running back to the hospital where the dimensional door closes behind them. But all is not well back in their home dimension, where they find the hospital patients chained to puzzle boxes. That's thanks to the Chenard Cenobite, who floats in looking great, but with lines that are far too zippy. The doctor is in. Shit. Yep, they're so bad they cause Tiffany to break her silence and run away. I recommend uh, dude, just shut up and kill, okay? You're not Fred Krueger. But go ahead and do that vibrating laugh again if you want to. <laughs> Kirsty and Tiffany round a corner into the Cenobites, including Chatterer looking different all of a sudden. Actor Nicholas Vince had requested eyes be added to his character so he could see. A scene was written to show Chatterer undergoing a change of appearance, but it was never filmed. So now Chatterer 2 shows up without any explanation. I'm not a fan of the redesign. Looks too rad like now. The Cenobites approach Kirsty, eager to finally have her as a plaything. Is your flesh we want to experience? She gives Pinhead that picture of Elliot Spencer and is all like, ain't this you? The Gash Gang had thought they were always and eternally Cenobites, but Kirsty shows them that they used to be human. I remember. Kirsty's got the OG Cenobites, sympathetic and a little vulnerable, but the new big bad is here and beckoning with his weird little tentacle finger. I love the stop motion effects on Chenard Cenobite's hand eel things. They were done by Rory Fellows and Carl Watkins at a time when stop motion was on the decline. I understand why this complicated and expensive process was phased out, but I always love seeing it in movies. Chenard Cenobite is fronting on Pinhead's turf, so it looks to me like we're about to have an all-out Cenobite! <laughs> Kirsty and Tiffany stand back as chains pierce Chenard and make him vibrate. 
that man, this guy. He fights back with his hand eels that free him from the chains and go flying into the Cenobites to kill them one by one. Each time they die, they're turned back into their previously human forms. It's interesting to see, especially the reveal, that Chatterer was a little kid. What was that kid's life that led to the puzzle box? Pinhead is saved for last. His Cenobite appearance is gradually taken away by laser blasts until he's looking like old Ellie Spence Ben once again. Chenard then kills him by slitting open his throat with a blade. The lead Cenobite Hellpriest goes down with a lot of gaping and tongue action, all while Chenard gives another mighty vibrato yell. <laughs> The deaths of the Cenobites has always been contentious, even with the actors who played them. I still don't acknowledge that a Cenobite can be killed. I think we are immortal. Um, so I still think we're there somewhere. Of course, maybe that's because they didn't get to play their human versions. I saw the movie and who's that? Brunette, babe. In the chaotic hospital, Tiffany says she has to go back to finish the puzzle. First, though, here are ten bodies of the patients who had puzzle boxes. I'll add nine to the count now, since we already included that one dude back when Chenard Cenobite killed him with puns. They get back to the hell door and run inside. So much of this movie is these two ladies running up and down hell's hallways. What is this, an episode of Doctor Who? In the hands of Julia's skin, they find the diamond-shaped lament configuration, which they take and run through the halls some more until they're outside the lab staring up at its lord. Leviathan turns its gaze towards Tiffany, which gives her a flash backstory. Something about her mom asking Dr. Chenard to help her, then I think he attacks her mom to kidnap Tiffany? I don't know, that's a little hard to interpret. Tiffany approaches Leviathan and takes a knee so she can solve the puzzle. Hurry girl, Chenard Cenobite is here and he's waving and whipping his eels around. Stop it eels, you nasty. He floats towards Tiffany with his tools of torture at the ready, when all of a sudden, what the fuck, Julia shows up again. I didn't! She open mouth smooches Chenard, giving Tiffany the chance to grab the puzzle and solve it. Good job, Tiffany. You made the box a box again. Diamond Lament configuration isn't nearly as cool. No offense, Leviathan. Chenard tries to attack Tiffany, but since the puzzle has been solved, I guess Leviathan's done using him as a hell puppet. With his hand knives stuck in the ground, the Chenard Cenobite is killed when Leviathan's tentacle rips his head halfway off. Holy shit! Man, that kill was phenomenal! Yeah! Tiffany almost falls to her death, but Julia gives her a hand. As turns out, that's not actually Julia's hand. It's only Julia's hand's skin being worn like a glove by the Hell Slayer, Kirsty Cotton. Kirsty had run back for that Julia body stocking and wore it to distract and defeat Dr. Chenard. Now these ladies had best get going on out of hell before the Lord of the Labyrinth defeats them with its, uh, energy cannonballs? Oh, some of them are wraith balls. Dope! Kirsty and Tiff finish their final lap down these hallways and get back inside the hospital room safe and sound. Are you done throwing a tantrum now, Leviathan? Good. Together, the ladies leave the Chenard Institute, and sometime later, the doctor's house is being emptied by movers. One of them is the same horny mover from the original Hellraiser, played by Oliver Parker. He finds the mattress he helped move back then, and is promptly murdered by it. His partner finds him with his lower half sticking out. A torture pillar pops up, but not just any pillar. The Pillar of Souls. It's a prison of the many Cenobite victims over the years, and has Bastard Skelly's boning and that very Hush Hush Baby Doll. It's also got Pinhead now, played by makeup lead Jeff Portis in his own prosthetics. Flesh Monster Julie is there too, played by makeup artist John Cormican. Cormican had played Julia for a close-up pickup shot earlier, and seemed to like wearing her prosthetics. I mean, they did give him mad cake. Little John also plays the returning bug munch and vagrant, who ends the movie with a familiar invitation. What is your pleasure, sir? How many folks were hellward bound on this incredible journey? Let's find out! Come along, love. I have such numbers to show you. By my count, there were 30 deaths in Hellraiser 2. The victims were 14 male humans, 10 female humans, 4 male-ish Cenobites, the literal female Cenobite, and 1 unknown hospital victim. That gives us a messy pie chart that's sure to have some hooks and chains in it. With a runtime of 99 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 3.3 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to the Chenard Cenobite. Only thing cooler than a decapitation is a half decap. It's so much messier. Love the bloody practical effects they used for this one. Dull Machete for Lamest Kill will go to the puzzle box patients who were killed off screen. And that's it. Hellbound Hellraiser 2 came out in 1988, completing what I think is an excellent horror duology. I agree with Clive Barker's assessment. I think it's an uneven movie, but I think the first movie's uneven too. The series would never reach this quality again, but we're still gonna look at the next two. They're fun in their own way. Until part three, I'm James A. Janice. 
This has been the Kill Count. On the next Kill Count. For two films, we have restricted ourselves to haunted houses and hospitals. This is what I mean. Your technique is all wrong. But no longer will we be limited when it comes to earthly planes. Very good. It is time for the Cenobites to stretch their legs. What? It is time for Hell on Earth. Shall we begin? In Hellraiser 3, Pinhead has become more of a slasher villain. He's here to kill people and laugh evilly, and a quip here or there couldn't hurt. Jesus Christ! Not quite. Not as much as the hell he's about to unleash upon this nightclub. <laughs> Seriously, y'all, I have no idea what the fuck I'm gonna do with this nightclub! Ugh, this is gonna take forever. This week, watch a more mainstream Hellraiser that also explores Pinhead's backstory. What the hell is going on? Hell is exactly what is going on. And this Friday, tune in for the kill count, only on Dead Meat. Relax, baby. This is better than sex. Hellraiser 3, Hell on Earth. You can currently be watched on the pictured streaming platforms. Demi always recommends you watch the movie for yourself before it's Kill Count. It's the only way to have your own properly informed opinion. Kill Counts are never meant to replace the experience of watching a film. Thanks a lot for watching this week's Kill Count. I want to thank some patrons like Moishi Grady, Tanner Strode, Balify Productions, Think Edge, Ellie Wismus, Call Me Connor 99, and Amy Eels. Also, thanks to Chelsea for being my bandaged lady. It's actually pretty hard to keep coming up with to the numbers bits. I hope we're able to do it. Thanks, everyone. Be good people.